Good evening, and welcome to tonight's installment of the Silverstein Lecture Series, uh, presented to you by the Center for Genetic Medicine here at Northwestern University. Uh, the Silverstein Lecture Series is made possible by a very generous donation from the Herman and D. Silverstein Foundation. And the object of this lecture series is to bring advances in genetics and medicine uh, to the general public. And tonight it is our great honor to have Dr. Ian Lipkin as our speaker. And Dr. Lipkin is one of the world's experts in microbial pathogenesis and identifying pathogens. Uh, Dr. Lipkin got his master's, or sorry, his bachelor's degree at Sarah Lawrence University in Bronxville, New York. Um, from there, he went to someplace familiar to many of us, uh, Rush Medical uh, College, Rush Medical College here in Chicago. So he's no stranger to the Chicago area. From there, he went to some of your clients down in La Jolla, where he got his uh, medical, or sorry, he did his uh, postdoctoral work, and then he became an assistant and ultimately full professor at the University of California, Irvine. From there, he went to Columbia, and I have to read these because they have very long names at Columbia. So he is currently the director for the Center for Infection and Immunity at Mailman School of Public Health and College of Physicians and Surgeons. He's also the John Snow Professor of Epidemiology. And outside of Columbia, he is the director of the World Health Organization Collaborating Center for Diagnostics and Zoonotic and Emerging Infectious Diseases. And he actually has other positions as well. Uh, he has distinguished himself in many regards. If I went through all his accolades, awards, and uh, activities, we would be here all night. We'd never get to hear from him. I just want to point out two that are particularly notable. Uh, he has been very active in the general world beyond just doing research. Uh, for example, he was the intermediary between uh, the World Health Organization and the Chinese government during the recent uh, 2003 SARS outbreak. And more recently, he was the, direct, uh, the chief technical consultant for the movie Contagion, which I believe many of us have seen. So it is uh, uh, a remarkable honor to have Dr. Lipkin here tonight, and he's going to tell us about small game hunting. Thank you. I'm going to, first of all, is this on now? Yes. Okay, very good. Um, it's wonderful to be home. Uh, in fact, I grew up in Hyde Park, so I spent the first 17 years of my life here. Uh, but I did spend the bulk of my career on the West Coast, and now I'm on the East Coast, and Midwest is still best. <laughs> so these are all the various things that we collect uh, in our lab. I started out with viruses, now we do bacteria, parasites, because my really interesting and the interest of the people with whom I work is really in, is, is in experimental pathology and trying to understand how people become ill. And frequently, there are relationships between bacteria and viruses that are important, and I'll try to illustrate some of these. Uh, as you heard on the John Snow Professor, the story of how I became the John Snow Professor is, a, is an interesting one, but I don't have time to go into this. But I will start with John Snow because I've become very interested in in John Snow. This is a map of a portion of London where there was a cholera outbreak in the middle 1850s. And John Snow was the one who implicated one pump as the source of the cholera outbreak. And there's a fanciful picture of him breaking off the handle of the pump and arresting the outbreak. In fact, the outbreak was already on the wane at the time he did this, but it makes really good copy. Uh, and, and it sort of illustrates the importance of molecular epidemiology in the next slide, which is what we now do. We look all over the world. We try to make predictions about where infectious agents are likely to emerge. And this is a picture which illustrates some of these points. The red ones are those that begin in animals and move into humans. The white ones are primarily human to human, although ultimately, if you go back far enough, you'll find that, in fact, most of those are originated in animals as well. And obviously, this is a heat map, so red means hot. There's a lot of disease there. And there are many things that contribute to disease and the spread and transmission of movement from, animal, from animals into people, breaking down of natural habitats, move, people moving places where they wouldn't ordinarily be, political strife, mass migrations, 
and of course the interconnectedness which increasingly defines our world so that something which is here is rapidly there. And this is a point that I will come back to as I will illustrate for you some examples of times where our team has gone out in various outbreaks. One of them you've already heard about, which was SARS. We are also involved with MERS in Saudi Arabia. And now I'll show you some very recent information that's beginning to come out with work we're doing in a place called Gorapur, which is just south of the Nepalese border, where there's an outbreak of encephalitis, which typically occurs with monsoon seasons. And we use sequencers, and the sequencers are getting smaller, and they're becoming less expensive to run. So when I first became interested in the notion of trying to define infectious diseases, it was during my second residency. I did a residency in internal medicine, thinking that I was going to be a cultural anthropologist and a medical anthropologist, and I finished this residency at the University of Washington, and I started writing around to people who might be able to give me a leg up so that I could do this sort of work in various parts of the world. And they all said to me, you know, the days of Albert Schweitzer are over, you know, unless you have a PhD in immunology or virology or biostatistics, we really don't have a role for you. So I went to neurology, which was really my second love, and I spent three years at University of California, San Francisco. And while I was there, HIV AIDS emerged and it took a very long time to figure out what this was. Those of you who will remember this period, we had these uh, cases of, of opportunistic pneumonias. But then I mean, these are agents which grow inside the lungs, which cause disease, which we don't typically see associated with disease in normal people, people with normal immune systems. There was a suggestion that there might be something you know, that linked all these cases. This became even more clear when blood transfusions were linked in an infant to similar opportunistic infections and reductions in the function of the immune system. Now, it took two years from the recognition of the clinical syndrome until people were able to identify it, first in Paris and then uh, at the NIH. And I was struck by this, and I decided that what I really wanted to do was to find ways in which we could shorten that time. Because as a physician, I was always struck by the fact that someone would come in with an obvious infectious disease, and we had no idea what it was, and we would use this approach called broad spectrum coverage, making our best guesses as to what we thought infected someone and there had to be a better way to do this. So what I began doing was working with some neurobiologists at Scripps using a method called subtractive cloning, which was extraordinarily tedious. And for those of you who are of my vintage or earlier, you'll remember what this was. Large amounts of radioactivity, hybridization solutions, cDNA libraries, it took years to do this. And in contrast, now with these new sequencing systems, one can rapidly identify infectious agents in a matter of a few days. And we've now done, I've lost track actually, it's now over 1,000 viruses. Many of them are not associated with any disease. Uh, and the Chinese government is trying to you know, map the territory even more rapidly than we are. I would say about 10% of what we find is linked in some way, directly or indirectly to a disease of wildlife, um, some sort of domestic animal or humans. We've made this um, even more tractable recently by finding ways in which we can uh, more efficiently select the relevant material for sequencing so it reduces the costs. This was a method that we reported a couple of years ago that was finally licensed by Roche. And what this allows anyone to do really is to take a sample use these sorts of kits that we've prepared and achieve what used to take us weeks to achieve. And it really is quite simple, and as I say, it's now licensed and other people can use it. Uh, the method is really quite simple. What we did is we tiled the entire library of known viral sequences. We print them. We incubate them, which means basically we place them into a tube with lots of other sequences representing a sample. Those then bind to the relevant sequences. We pull those down, we put them into a sequencing machine. Here's a small one here. And that then gives extraordinarily rich 
approach. So here, what I've tried to do is to represent for you how much enrichment you get. So these are what we typically refer to as orders of magnitude. This would be a tenfold advantage, 100 to 1,000 fold. But you can see what this means is that for the price that it used to cost us to get sequence to do discovery, we've reduced that dramatically to somewhere between one and 10% of what it used to cost. And in addition, the back end, which is where we analyze what's present in a sample, is also simplified. So the math that's required to figure out what's reasonable is also reduced. The, a couple of days ago, we used this approach um, in the ICU where there was somebody who had an unexplained meningitis, who had been placed on what was presumed to be effective therapy for that meningitis. That individual wasn't improving. We use this sort of an approach. We identified a fungus, and that individual is now improving. So at Northwest, and I'm sure if you don't yet have it, you will have it shortly, and people will be doing this not only for viruses, but for bacteria and fungi and all the pathogens of interest. Um, as I look around this audience, it's clear to me that there, this is probably not a relevant slide, so I'm just going to move on. Um, these are the various places worldwide where people are now beginning to use this system. It is really quite simple. Uh, and I'm going to give you a couple of examples of how powerful it can be. So Columbia has a global reach, as do many universities, and we run programs in Africa and elsewhere. And here's a survey of respiratory disease that we undertook in Uganda, where people had used traditional molecular methods and had failed. We were able to find a wide range of viruses, which has an impact for when people think about what might be the appropriate vaccine to develop next. So we all know about the polio eradication campaign and measles and other viruses. Well, what's next? So you can look at the burden of disease and try to make decisions about how to invest. We've done the same sort of thing in encephalitis. This is some work that we've done with a group in Liverpool, again, where they failed to find things. And you can see here now that in a third of those, we've resolved the, resolved the question and found additional agents and again, you can use this for public health to make decisions about how you will want to approach a problem. With support from the Gates Foundation, we've extended this kind of an approach to bacteria as well. And this will allow us then to do the same thing with bacteria that we've already done with viruses. And these are the various species that we've identified. We're also looking at antimicrobial resistance because one of the things that physicians need to do early on is to not only know what the agent is, but also whether or not there's an associated antibiotic resistance gene that would have an impact on the kind of approach that they might take. All of that aside, sometimes these methods fail. If you have a truly new virus, which is what happened in the first virus I discovered at the beginning of my career, and this one more recently, which was a virus that's wiping out large numbers of tilapia, billions of dollars worth of fish, you have to use unbiased methods. And this is an example of this sort of work. This is work we undertook with the government of Israel. Uh, and the individual in my group who did this was Nishay Mishra, who's a, an assistant professor. And the important thing to bear in mind here is that when we talk about threats to humankind, we always focus on diseases of humans. We are a monoculture. <laughs> we grow all the corn next to one another, all the wheat in one place, so that if something comes in as a blight, you could eradicate huge amounts of food. So we are focusing on trying to address diseases of livestock and plants and others using these same approaches. Now, in this instance, you can see all the places in the world where you have these tilapia farms. Very important source of protein as well as funding in the third world. And most of the tilapia that's consumed worldwide is actually consumed in the United States. I don't particularly like tilapia, um, but apparently many people do. So what you see happens is these fish are distorted. And one of the reasons we were very interested in this in Israel is that tilapia are St. Peter's fish. So there were pilgrims who were going to uh, the Sea of Galilee and expecting to eat tilapia, and all the tilapia were decimated. 
Also in Ecuador, we had the same problem. So when we began doing high throughput sequencing, we didn't find anything that remote, looked remotely like anything else. But what we did find that will be interest to at least one person in the back of the room is that there were 10 segments that were consistently found in the preparation from the fish that were sick. And they ranged in size from about a half a kilobase to one and a half kilobases. And at the termini, they were similar. This suggested to us that we might have a segmented virus. And when we really pushed hard, we found a vague resemblance at the protein level to an influenza protein. We then labeled those genome fragments and we took samples from the intestine, the liver, the heart, and the brain of these animals and demonstrated that we could see signal corresponding to these gene segments, which told us that we had localized this infectious agent to the very tissues where we saw the disease. Electron microscopy revealed these regular particles, which look like viruses and in turn represent viruses. And then we did what's known as northern hybridizations and demonstrated that there were correlates in the molecular cycle, the replication of this virus that were associated with each of these individual gene segments. And as a result of this work, we are now making a vaccine which is being used to treat these fish, which will save billions of dollars and hopefully um, help Columbia to some extent, building its endowment. Okay. <laughs> so uh, I'm now I'm gonna talk about um, the whole process of pathogen discovery and how much uncharted territory there might be. I'm going, to make, I'm going to talk with the caveat that this is very sloppy work, but it's really the only way we could do it at the time. This work was largely done by consensus PCR. This is a method by which you take specific sequences that are common to viruses representing specific classes or species or genera. You can just think of them as types of viruses for the purposes of this talk, and we then use this method to see whether or not in this one species of mammal, giant, um, these giant flying foxes, also known as Tropius giganteus, whether or not we had any of these viruses. And we found that in fact, there were 55 viruses in the population we studied in Bangladesh, 50 of them using criteria that have been established by the regular the group that classifies these things called the International Committee for taxonomy of viruses, 50 of them met the, the classification as being novel. So that was interesting and we were able to publish it in a journal that people care about and so on. And what we then decided to ask was whether or not we could use these findings to make predictions about how many unknown viruses there might be at a certain snapshot in time if we went across all mammalian species. So what this requires is some, you know, a few things that I have to define for you. So if you look at the number of mammalian species that are known worldwide, at the time we did this work, this work it was roughly 5,500. If we had stopped sampling at a certain time point, we were able to say we would have captured this percentage or that percentage of the next, and that then allowed us to extrapolate what would be the case if we wanted to look at all of these mammalian species, again at one time point? We calculated from that very coarse sort of figure, 320,000 viruses as the lower bound. And then we said, using the methods that we'd employed, it would cost us about 6.3 billion US dollars to get them all, $1.4 billion for 85% coverage. And then one of my co-authors insisted that we try to sell this from the vantage point of how this was a great deal. <laughs> so we talked about the economic impact of SARS, and then we talked about MERS and all these other things, and we said, look, this is a pittance compared to what all these other things cost us. And I, got, I had a call from the World Bank, and they were very excited about this project for about a day. And then they called me back and said, thank you very much, Professor, but I don't think, I think we're gonna pass. So um, in any event, it's interesting to consider all this uncharted territory. I'm not saying that all of it causes disease. Now, I'm gonna show you an example that people don't generally cite. It's actually the only example thus far 
where using these approaches has led to the recognition of an infectious agent that has actually resulted in the interruption of an outbreak. This didn't happen with Ebola, didn't happen with SARS, didn't happen with MERS. It did happen with this virus named Lujo, after Lusaka and Johannesburg. Lusaka, Zambia, Johannesburg, South Africa. And this was when we were just beginning to work with WHO, and we were asked to evaluate samples that had tested negative for a whole series of candidate agents, including viruses associated with hemorrhagic fevers, like loss of fever, and Ebola, and Marburg. And these had been tested at a variety of locations. We're only talking here about South Africa, but Atlanta as well. So what we did was to find samples from these individuals, and I'll show you how this played out in a moment. This slide makes the point that the identification agent was critical. There was a woman who was 36 years of age, healthy. She was a travel agent. She was taking people on a safari. She cut her leg. She became sick, so sick that she lapsed into a coma. She was airlifted to uh, Johannesburg to a hospital where they had containment. On the way, she infected the paramedic who was with her in the plane. The nurse who received her on the other end, the cleaner who took care of the room, all four of these people died. This nurse took care of these people. She became sick and she alone survived. And the reason she survived was because we identify the agent as an arena virus. She received ribavirin treatment and she survived. So she was sick for four days and she improved. We still don't know the reservoir for this particular virus, and it is the most lethal virus described to date. I showed you 80% mortality in young, healthy people who had no risk factors that we know of, and it would have been 100% if that last individual had not received therapy. Now, I'm gonna talk with you a little bit about MERS to sort of illustrate how we go about trying to track down the reservoirs for infectious diseases and how we investigate how people become ill. Many of you remember that in 2012, there was a man who was otherwise good health, or so we thought, in a town that was remote uh, from Riyadh in Saudi Arabia, who developed a progressive pneumonia. A virus was identified in Riyadh, or Jeddah, I'm not sure, I don't recollect at this point. It was sent to Erasmus University where Ron Fouché sequenced it, described it as a novel virus, coronavirus, and we were then asked by the Ministry of Health to go to Saudi Arabia and see if we'd figure out where this virus came from. Now the man who was the first identified case of infection with the MERS coronavirus lived in the small town. He had four camels. They will prove to be very important a little later on in the story. And he had four houses, three houses that were already built and a fourth that was under construction. So when we tried to find out if he had any sort of underlying illnesses that might predispose to his becoming infected, we were told that he had three wives and was about to take a fourth. We flew into Riyadh. We went from Riyadh to Bisha. And again, this is a picture of the home. And then we began talking with people, trying to understand something about his exposures. The closest virus in the database to what we'd recovered and other people had recovered, including Ron from this individual, was a virus that had been identified in bats. So we went looking for bats. Uh, these are two Nigerian veterinarians who are working with the Minister of Health, John Epstein from EcoHealth Alliance, that's me. And this is his favorite son, the, the man who died. And then I went around and met a variety of people. This is some guy who wound up in all the photographs. We still haven't figured out who he is. It's sort of like, <laughs> sort of like where's Waldo or something. And, th and this is his brother. Uh, and, and they were lovely people and they were very interested in trying to help us sort this out. The challenge was that we couldn't really interview any of the women because you couldn't come into contact with them. So we had to do all of this through Pakistani women interpreters and things got a little bit muddled, but eventually we sorted out the exposure history. Now we went looking for bats and we told that there were no bats, uh, but nonetheless, you can see us here scurrying around looking for these bats. 
And we found plenty of evidence of bats, as you can see here. This is bat guano, uh, and these are various ruins. And, and this is now just as the sun is going down. There are four of us who are out there, and we're taking this video so that we can prove that, in fact, there are bats. And then we went back to this man's home, and we swabbed these camels. Now, many of you may not know this, but the Saudis have different types of camels. They have camels that they use for working. Those are frequently the camels that they eat. They have racing camels, and then they have what are known as beautiful camels, and the beautiful camels are pets. And this, as you can see, is a beautiful camel. He's quite shy. And you have to get dressed to swab this beautiful camel. Uh, this was our driver. This is just before we go into the caves to collect specimens. And we did find one bat that had sequences, but it was not enough to account for the outbreak. So we then began looking for other evidence within the kingdom for infection. This required building these um, remote sampling App, you know, kits that would allow us to not only do molecular biology, but also look for antibodies. Because when you have an infection, if you're lucky, you catch it there at the time that it's manifest. Sometimes the infectious agent is gone and all you have are the footprints. That is to say, the antibodies that tell you that the animal, the human has been infected. So we wanted to take this approach. Um, and then what we did was we went all around Saudi Arabia and collected specimens, including in this area here, known as the empty quarter. The empty quarter is truly empty. No, no, no oases, no vegetation. It really is difficult. Um, and we looked initially for antibodies. And what we found very quickly was that 95% of the adult camels, that is to say camels over the age of two had antibodies, indicating that they'd been infected. 55% of the juveniles, that is to say animals under the age of two, for 74% antibody positivity, if you're looking at hundreds of camels all over Saudi Arabia. When we went looking for infectious virus or viral nucleic acid, it was the reciprocal. So the animals that were the juveniles, less than two years of age, were more likely to have virus or virus nucleic acid than the adults. And what apparently happens is that the infection occurs quite early. Every single outbreak we know thus far in humans has been linked to an individual who has had a contact of some sort with camels. Now, once it moves into the human population, that becomes different again. And I went back and did some work in hospitals in Saudi Arabia, and we found that there are individuals who are healthcare workers who are becoming infected, who are using masks that were designed to prevent aerosol transmission, but they were wearing them over beards, which obvi obviously they're not going to work. So we had some effect there just by doing simple changes with hygiene. We were then told people were very upset about the idea that camels had a MERS coronavirus and uh, it said, in our cases, two-thirds have had no contact with camels. Directly, yes, but not indirectly. They've all had indirect comment. And here, when we went through Riyadh, this is a butcher shop. What you typically do is put the head of a camel here to illustrate the age of the, of the uh, meat that's there. And if you've had, has anybody here ever eaten camel? It's, it's very, very chewy. It's sort of like um, very old mutton, so I don't really recommend it. Uh, but you can see here, this is, this is within Riyadh, and you can see people are very engaged with their camels. I have no idea what this guy's doing, but I think it makes the point that there's plenty of opportunity. Now, more recently, we've been working with, with the Indian Council for Medical Research in Uttar Pradesh, where there are yearly outbreaks in Gorapur and just north of Gorapur of kids who are developing encephalitis. And there are over 1,000 kids who died already uh, this monsoon season uh, in this particular area. And may, some of you may have read some of this in the Times. The night the oxygen ran out, that's not why the children died. Um, but these kids are clearly dying from something, and we need to do something. And it has had an impact on the political economy, just as it did 
with MERS, where there were health ministers who were sacked and mayors who were sacked. And similarly in China, the mayor of, of uh, Beijing and the health minister and so forth, and the head of CDC were sacked. So we're trying to stop this now. This is work that's active and I'm going back to India next week to try to do this. Now this is the area that's affected. It's immediately south of Nepal. What's important to know about the, ag about the whole um, you know, ecology of the region is that there are rivers that start in India, go up into Nepal where there are no dams, and then come back into this area here. And these floodplains you know, flood annually. And you can see here, this is in Gorapur, everything is flooded. Now the people who are primarily affected are the people who are uh, known as the Musaharis. These are called, they're called rat eaters. And in fact, this is where they get a large portion of their protein. They're the, the lowest members of the Dalit caste. Um, and since the Indian constitution in 1955, there's, you know, this whole notion of untouchables, you know, was held not to be the case. And, you know, there's been an effort to promote people and so forth. But in some of the rural areas, they still don't have adequate food. They don't have medical care. They don't have schools. It really is miserable. And they live literally on insects and rodents and other uh, things that other people would normally turn away for. So these kids are the ones who are becoming affected. Now, this is the entrance to this hospital, which serves 50 million people. Um, you can see the conditions are, you know, they're really quite miserable. Um, here I'm in the ICU examining one of these children with encephalitis. They have no space, so they've got two children per bed. They're building a 500 bed hospital to take care of the overflow. But what we really need to do is to figure out why these children are sick. So we went to Gorapur, we extracted nucleic acid. I brought it back um, so that we can analyze it as what we know as cDNA, which is non-toxic, non-infectious, and easily to easy to bring in. And what we have found is that there are a wide range of different viruses uh, in these children, as well as bacteria. So there is no single agent, which is what everyone had hoped we would find. These children are probably being exposed by mosquitoes, ectoparasites that are located on these rodents, infectious agents, both bacterial as well as viral, that are present within the drinking water you saw what they have to drink. So what we're going to have to do really is do something about poverty. Um, but we're going back. We're going to try to move that forward shortly. I'm just going to touch on this very briefly because I, I don't want to spend a lot of time on it. Uh, many years ago, I was the uh, co-chair of something called the National Biosurveillance Advisory Subcommittee that reported the White House on the risk of, of bioterrorism. Uh, and in fact, uh, we always thought that this was overrated. I think now with synthetic biology, many of us are coming around to think, thinking about whether or not this is something we need to re-engage. And so there have been a number of meetings recently to address these kinds of problems. Uh, and I think this is something about which we need to be concerned. I'm going to show you one example where we thought we had an infectious agent, but we didn't because it's another fascinating story, even though, again, it's an old story, but it will come up again. It's a classic. We were asked to look at individuals who are working in a pork processing plant in the Midwest. This one was in Minnesota, but there was another one in Indiana. And the question was whether or not these individuals who were developing weakness in their in their uh, their hands and their feet had some infectious process. People thought it might be something called Guillain-Barre syndrome. Other people thought it might be something called a prion disease. It didn't sound like either of these things to me, but the more I heard about it, the more I thought it would be an interesting question to solve. So we went and evaluated how this could be coming about. This is a processing plant which takes 30,000 pigs a day and runs them through. I won't tell you the name of the, the meat packing plant. It would be known to, well known to all of you. Um, every place you see a blue or a purple rectangle, I don't know what color that projects to you, is where there's a, a worker who is not affected by this particular problem. And those are where the nice bits of the pork are located. 
The yellow ones is where they're either removing the brain or packing the brain, or these are the individuals who are affected. So if this were an infectious disease, you might expect that it would start here, then go there, then go there, then go there, and so forth, but it didn't. It looked more like some sort of dose exposure, and that's precisely what it was. So this is the snout of the pig, that's the eye of the pig, this is the base of the skull of the pig, here is a high pressure hose going in through a pressure plate, and you can see bare skin here. And what was going on was that the people who ran this plant had found that they could sell brain material in the Far East to people who wanted it for puddings and other sorts of meat supplements. And they'd come up with this very clever way of getting the brain material out of the skull without cracking the skull. So with a high pressure hose, they could liquefy the brain material. It would run down here like so into a large cistern where it'd be collected, frozen, and shipped. The problem was that this was generating these big aerosols of brain. And pigs and humans are not that different. So in fact, what they were developing was an autoimmune disease because they were exposed to something called peripheral nerve system, peripheral nerve system myelin and central nervous system myelin. So it looked like a disease that we've been creating the lab for many years called EAE or EAN, depending on which one you want to emphasize. So the solution for this particular problem was to simply stop doing this. Now, those of you who are scientists will know that this is not exactly where anyone wants to see the work published, but that was the best we could do, plus one. In any event, it's a very interesting story, and we solved the problem, proved not to be an infectious disease. I'm going to shift gears a little bit now and talk with you about work we've done closer to home. This is an area in New York City, roughly noon, between Chinatown and City Hall. So this is not a great advertisement for come see New York. But you have the same rats. They're all over the place. I had two brilliant uh, young women working with me, Kaylee Firth and Mirabat, both vegetarians who decided that they wanted to do this study in honor of uh, a, a, you know, a deceased colleague of ours named Josh Letterberg, who'd always been very interested in infectious diseases in New York City. Now this is, uh, this is the, the project, we call it Rats of New York, after the movie Gangs of New York. And this is sort of the same posture, we found a rat in the same posture as Daniel Day-Lewis, if you actually look back at that particular picture, you'll see these guys are all represented. So we focused here on the lower portion of Manhattan, and we found a whole range of nasty bacteria that are associated with human disease, like Clostridium difficile and Bartonella and Salmonella and Shigella and Yersinia and so forth. The most interesting finding, however, was this virus, a rodent hepasivirus, that I subsequently gave to um, Amit Kapoor, who was a fellow in the lab at that point, and Charlie Rice to work on. And it has now replaced hepatitis C in chimpanzees as the animal model that people can use to try to study immune response to hepatitis C, because it looks just like hepatitis C. And for those of you who are virologists in the audience, I'll tell you simply that we did um, PCR on both strands in both orientations, demonstrated that the virus was replicating in the liver and only in the liver, and that the virus had an element that's associated with hepatotropism called MIR-122, and that you could get multiple genotypes in the same animal at the same time. So it's a great model for hepatitis C. More recently, we've been working on mice, and this is work that's been submitted. Uh, we have two main authors, Stuart Little, as you can see here, and Simon Williams, and what we've been doing here is looking at viruses in all the boroughs except Staten Island. And these are the various collaborators we have, including this guy who's quite colorful, Bobby Corrigan, who runs something called the New York City Rodent Academy. So you can actually get a certificate, if you like, from the Rodent Academy. So he has found a wide range of viruses, nothing yet that's very interesting. But when we started looking at bacteria, we found even more bacteria in these mice than we'd found in the rats, and we found a whole series of antibiotic resistance genes. And this is particularly important for human medicine 
Because unlike rats, which really live outside, and the most successful rats are the ones who are deep in the sewers, the ones who are a little less successful wind up in the subways, and the least successful who get pushed out onto the street where it's cold and there isn't a lot of food are the ones that are the weakest. Mice, in contrast, live inside our houses, so the opportunity for infection and gene exchange is much, much higher with mice. Ticks. I know you have ticks, probably not as bad as we do, but they really are nasty creatures. Here's a tick that's not consumed any blood. This is a tick that's consumed a lot of blood. They have a whole range of infectious agents, and one of the members of our group, another assistant professor, Rafal Tokars, has been characterizing these. And what he's found is that in Long Island and in Connecticut, two very, very wealthy communities where we've been able to get access to these kinds of animals, we found that almost three quarters of ticks are infected with one human pathogen, and roughly a third are infected with at least two. Leading us to the next question, which is, why isn't there more disease? And the answer is, there's in fact a lot of disease. And there are hundreds of thousands of cases of Lyme disease now in North America, annually. We have found a wide range of interesting viruses, some of them viruses that nobody's ever seen the like of before. And what we're trying to do now to figure out whether or not they could be responsible for any of these acute, or excuse me, these chronic Lyme syndromes is to develop antibody tests, which we can use to explore whether or not humans have been exposed. Which leads me sort of the next phase of the work that we're going to do, which is talk with you about the antibody response. This allows us to examine historical infection. Very, very important and the complement to the genetic methods that have moved so rapidly. So again, we're using these sorts of slides as ways in which we can print things very rapidly. And all of this has been advanced by the interest in things like cell phones, right, and SIM cards that allow us to print microcircuits and do things much, much more rapidly. So what we've done first is we created a peptide array representing all known viruses. We couldn't possibly cover everything with the real estate that was allowable, but we were able to print things that were sub-syndromes, like let's say we want to distinguish MERS coronavirus and SARS coronavirus. This is a single letter code which represents the amino acids encoded by the genomes of these viruses. And you can see that there are very different patterns that are picked up by individuals who've been exposed to those two viruses. Now, the most relevant and important example of how we're going to use this is with Zika. So we recently um, were named as the people responsible for generating the molecular diagnostics for what's known as the ZIP study, which is the Zika in pregnancy study, which is designed to figure out what the ramifications are of infection during pregnancy with Zika virus. The challenge is that Zika virus typically is associated with areas where we also have dengue virus infection. So if we want to know whether or not an individual has been exposed to Zika, we can't do it using the usual sorts of methods. So by printing these very, very discrete arrays on microscope slides that are 70 by 25 millimeters, we can identify individuals who've been exposed to Zika or dengue or both. And this then will allow us to tell a woman who's been in an area, you've been exposed to Zika or not. Now, what I can't share with you today, because I don't have permission to do so, is that we've done metabolomic studies now on plasma and serum from women who have been exposed to Zika and had children with microcephaly and women who have been exposed to Zika and don't have microcephaly. And we have found products that serve as biomarkers that will allow us to say this is probably how you know, we can identify during pregnancy whether or not this is going to be a child who's going to be at risk for microcephaly. And the woman and the physician and the family can then decide whether they do or don't want to bring that pregnancy to term. 
We've also used this for tick-borne diseases. At present, the way you make a diagnosis of Lyme disease is that you have a two-step assay. It takes two days to do. You start with something called ELISA, which is a very crude assay where you take all the proteins of the virus or a select subset, you put them into a plate that's got lots and lots of holes, you add the blood from the individual, and then you come back and you say, this one looks like it's got antibodies and this one doesn't, based on a change in color that you can observe in a specific instrument. And then if it's positive, you then need to do what's known as a Western blot or a neutralization, which means that you have to do a much more complicated assay and that takes time and it costs money. But with this approach, you can find simultaneously in one assay that there are several indications that the individual has been exposed and you can say, this person needs to be treated for this or that. In addition, because we're able to do more than just the causative agent of Lyme disease, we can also say, you have a whole series of other things that require different types of treatment regimens. So at present, you can't go to your physician and say, I would like to be tested for exposure to all of these different agents. But within the next year or two, this should be feasible. And these are the kinds of things that I wanted to do when I was a practicing physician, but I think are now tractable and possible. So here you can see, for example, we can look at individuals with Lyme disease, and we can see that early on, there are certain things that are picked up Later on, many more become apparent, and that's not surprising either. And here are individuals who are infected with Borrelia, but also have Babesia. So this means that you can't treat them with one antibiotic, you need to treat them with two. So this is gonna be very important, it's gonna have a huge impact. So these are early microbiome specialists, and they're very excited about their data as they're dancing around these fecal samples. Now our group uh, is trying to develop this whole bowl to biome approach where we take feces, rapidly collect them and analyze them. And I'll talk with you a little bit about how I think the bacterium, the microbiome is gonna be important. We started with something very simple, uh, or so we thought, which was something called stillbirth. This is where children are born dead. Uh, it's very common in the developing world, less so uh, in, in the developed world. Some of these children have genetic defects, but many of them don't. And what we focused on with a team that had been studying this from a genetic perspective was whether or not we could get a handle on what was going on in those individuals who didn't have a genetic defect, didn't have a placental defect, but had something that looked like it might be infectious. The first thing we did was to use a method called 16S PCR, which gives you a very crude read on whether or not there are bacteria in a sample. And we looked in case placentas and we looked in control placentas, and the burden of bacteria was much, much higher in the case placenta than the controls. And in the case livers, we found the same bacteria that had been identified in the livers. And we didn't, obviously we don't have any control livers because none of the parents were willing to let us sample the livers of their normal children. They're just difficult that way. Um, but then when we went back and looked at the placentas and asked what the, what the flora were, what bacteria were present, the red ones illustrate those that are associated with stillbirth and the green ones are live birth. And you can see quite rapidly that certain things come out. This is Streptococcus, urea plasma, Prevotella bivia, which will come up shortly again. If you look over the course of gestation at when individuals might be stillborn, what you find is that there are different bacteria at different time points. Now, people have been very concerned about Streptococcus for many years because there is an infection that occurs immediately after birth which is associated with streptococcus. And as a result, there's been an effort to both screen women for streptococcus and to vaccinate them. Now, when we did this, we found the following. Women are typically screened for this bacterium at 35 to 37 weeks 
gestation because the risk again is here, or so they thought. There's a trivalent vaccine that's given a little bit earlier. So the question is, are these measures of any value? And then we decided to look at all the different types of GBS that might be covered by the vaccines. And this required going back and actually culturing these bacteria and doing serotyping, which is a method that's classical, it's not molecular, but it's what you need to do. What we learned, in fact, of course, was you can see that a large burden of streptococcal disease here, which occurs at less than 23 weeks, is not going to be covered by this vaccine. Furthermore, the trivalent vaccine that covers the three serotypes misses 33. Therefore, 75% of vaccine preventable stillbirth is not covered by the current approaches. So this is an example of where you can use these sorts of microbiome approaches to understand and appreciate ways in which you could change public health initiatives. Here's another one. This goes back to HIV, which is where it all began for me. We began working with a group in South Africa that's called Caprisa. And what they've been trying to do is to understand transmission of HIV. They've been focusing primarily on women between the ages of 15 and 24, heterosexual women who are subject to violence uh, and multiple sexual partners through no fault of their own. And they've been giving them vaginal uh, viricides, that is to say anti-herpes drugs. And the hope was that this was going to make it possible for them to interfere with the, the transmission of infection. And what they found was that there are a group of women who, despite receiving this treatment, were becoming infected. And they had evidence of inflammation in their vaginas when you measured things called cytokines. And the question was, what was driving that? Our hypothesis was that it could be fungi or bacteria or viruses. It proved to be, in fact, bacteria, as I'll show you. So if you look at the bacteria, I don't expect you to see anything more than the colors are different here than there. When we use the same sort of color wheel that I showed you a moment ago for stillbirth, what you can find is that HIV infection and inflammation tend to go together. And what's particularly interesting is that Prevotella bivia, which is what we saw was implicated in stillbirth, primarily in African-American women in the United States, is also important in Sub-Saharan Africa as a driver for HIV. And these two, Shuttleworthia and Megasphere, were actually protective, suggesting that you might be able to use vaginal probiotics to reduce the risk of infection with HIV. So you can see where you can begin to put this together and look at very interesting new ways to treat. The, and here's the mechanism. So P. bivia, which expresses a component of the bacterial cell wall called polysaccharide, lipopolysaccharide, drives the cytokine levels, which draws the infectable cells into the vaginal vault, breaks down the vaginal mucosa. And we're very excited about this because even though we don't have an HIV vaccine, we may have a probiotic that may be of some help. The last thing I'm going to talk about is chronic disease. And this is more complicated because here now, you're integrating not only the infectious agent, but the genes and the environment and the timing. And this is extraordinarily important because this is really, I think, the future of, of microbiology and certainly virology. This is a model based on influenza virus, but you can do the same thing with this component of bacterial cell wall that I just showed you was driven by P. bivio, or with something called polyadenosine cytosine, which mimics replication of viruses. These are mice roughly halfway through gestation, gestational day 9.5, and if you expose the mothers uh, to this uh, stimulus, whether it's influenza or it's LPS or it's poly IC, you get the same effect. The animal is withdrawn in the corner of a cage, whereas the animal that's the control is running around and exploring. If we do the same thing several days later, the control looks fairly similar, but this animal is hyperactive. So what's interesting here is it's the same genetic background, the same exposure, different timing, profoundly different effect. And the profoundly different effect is a function of the fact that the different areas of the nervous system are at risk at various points. And that's what this illustrates. Now, obviously, 
We can't do experiments like this in humans, but what we can do is go into birth cohorts. Some of you may aware of this, be aware of this large cohort of a million people that's already been set up in the United States, but the Norwegians, uh, and I've been part of this since 1999, 2000, this is actually why I moved to Colombia, have been doing this, and we now have children who are 18 years of age. And what we're trying to do is to go back and look at samples and questionnaires that have been obtained prospectively before diseases manifest and see whether or not there are insights that we might get as to exposures various time points. So we've looked at alcohol and smoking and a wide range of other things. And this is intuitively obvious if you think about it because when you're pregnant, you're told to avoid certain kinds of drugs, certain kinds of exposure and so forth. So why wouldn't we expect that infection would have such an effect? If you have more than three episodes of fever, after the first trimester, your odds rate of having a child born with autism go up threefold. If you take acetaminophen, acetaminophen reduces your risk, except in the instances where you take acetaminophen for something other than fever, like headaches or pain, in which case it increases your risk. And if you look in cord blood obtained on the day of birth, you find that there are pro-inflammatory cytokines which are indicative of inflammation in the fetus at the very end. And what we've now been able to identify is that there are certain triggers that are infectious which are associated with this. If you have high titers of antibodies against herpes simplex type two, not low titers, but very high titers, indicative of recent infection during pregnancy at a specific time point, that also increases your risk dramatically. Now, it's twofold increased risk, and there's a wide confidence interval for those of you who know what that means, but nonetheless, it's a consistent finding, and we think it's very powerful, but it's not herpes. If you have flu, you have the same thing, but this has to be flu where the woman is very, very ill. And we use this to make the argument that vaccination during pregnancy to prevent severe attacks of flu is something which is a critical public health intervention. It doesn't always succeed uh, with that portion of the community that's not interested in taking vaccines, but it's very important. Now, we were recently given a center of excellence, granted a center of excellence for investigation of myalgic encephalomyelitis, chronic fatigue syndrome. It would not surprise me if we had some people here who were interested in this. We have been doing microbiome research metabolomic research, integrating all these things using topological networks that were originally developed for business, for people who want to make decisions about which stock is going to go up or down without knowing anything about the underlying mechanics of that industry. You can do this, and this has recently been applied for biology, and we have found now that there are specific populations of bacteria that are important in individuals who are who are you know, higher than normal body weights, and we've been able to link these to specific biosynthetic pathways that have an impact on energy metabolism, brain function, and this is just beginning to open up. It's very exciting. We have another project uh, where we've looked at spinal fluids from these people, and everything is beginning to hang together. So if there's anybody in the audience who has MECFS or knows anybody who has MECFS, the attention that's Layson be recently been attack, you know, focused on this condition will pay off. And I think three to five years is really the time frame that we should be considering. I'm going to close with a movie, Contagion, which is sort of the best of Contagion, unless you want me to shut down, uh, which I'm happy to do too. I was asked to make many movies. This is the only one I decided to make. It was interesting because Two days in a row, I met with a representative from somebody who'd built uh, Blade Runner, which apparently didn't do that well last weekend, uh, and, and Steven Soderbergh. And Soderbergh said, I want to make a realistic movie. Now, there are flaws in this movie, but it's the best of breed, okay? And that's all we could hope for. So I'll just show you a bit of that uh, and then take questions. How many people are going to die? Well, in 1918, 
One percent of the population died from Spanish flu. It was novel, like this. No one had ever seen it before. One percent of America? One percent of the world. With the new mutation, we are predicting an r naught of no less than four. And without a vaccine, we can anticipate that approximately one in 12 people on the planet will contract the disease. So at this point, I think we have to believe this is respiratory. Maybe fomites, too. What's that, fomites? Uh, it refers to transmission from surfaces. The average person touches their face two or three thousand times a day. Two or three thousand times a day? Three to five times every waking minute. In between, we're touching doorknobs, water fountains, elevator buttons, and each other. Those things become fomites. Honey? Oh, Beth, Beth. Hey, 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 honey, honey. Beth, Jesus, Jesus. Sweet, sweetheart. Sweetheart. You had a seizure this morning, Beth. Have right. you had something like that she before? She had a history of seizures? No, no, no. no. Allergies, other no. medical problems? Uh, uh, she's, she, I think she's she allergic to pe recently? penicillin. Did she fall recently? Did her head no, in the no, shower? No, no, no. She came back from a trip and she, she What about was, drugs? Uh, MDMA? Ecstasy? No, no, we don't do that. OK, let's Jesus. get some help. Beth, oh. Beth. Okay. Sir, you have to go. Yes. Let's get a line in her. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in the United States and the World Health Organization in Switzerland confirmed today that Dr. Ian Sussman of San Francisco has succeeded in growing the MEV1 virus in a laboratory setting. Officials at the CDC cautioned that the breakthrough is only the first step toward developing a vaccine, which is likely still months away from human trials. The WHO estimates the number of people infected worldwide to be over 8 million. to give out 50 doses today. What? That's our oh forsythia 11. Oh hey, excuse me, there's a line here. Excuse me. This vaccine is a result of the courage and perseverance of a remarkable few. We shall now begin the drawing, John. First MEV1 vaccination are those people born on March 10th, March 10th. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm just going to leave this slide up. These are the people who actually do the work. I just present it. It's been a pleasure.
And I'm happy to take questions if there are some. Let me turn this on. Um, and I'd ask that people use the microphone for questions because we are recording this and it would be great to be able to get the questions as well as the answers. So. Is there an effective uh, vaccine for Lyme disease available? And if so, if not, why not? Okay, so th that was actually two questions. Um, so the question was, is there an effective vaccine for Lyme disease? And if so, I guess really why isn't it available? So the answer is, there really are two vaccines that have been developed for Lyme disease. Um, you know, it appears as though they're both, they were both uh, valid, they were both effective. Um, the reason that, um, that they're not generally available except for pets at this point although you can take that particular vaccine for your dog if you like and it'll be perfectly good and uh, probably uh, you know if you can get a vet to do that I know a lot of people who have um, is that there was concern about the litigation um, there was a report suggesting that there were similarities in analysis of the proteins that were associated with the vaccine that were reminiscent of normal human proteins and the risk of connective tissue disease or autoimmune disease, whatever you want to call it, was there. And the companies that were manufacturing it, after doing an enormous amount of work and investing a great deal of money, decided that it wasn't worth the risk. So they stepped away from the vaccine. There is an effort now to try to resurrect that vaccine and to make some additional vaccines. I know. Uh, that the Centers for Disease Control is trying to do something of this sort. Uh, and there are people who are doing this under the auspices of the, uh, uh, the, Steve, uh, uh, the Stephen and Alex Cohn Foundation in Connecticut. I've not had the vaccine. I would love to have it, but I haven't uh, succeeded in tracking it down myself. I'm not speaking from complete knowledge on this topic, uh, but I know that um, vaccine manufacturers over the years, the number of vaccine manufacturers has gone down um, and uh, the vaccine industry has consolidated. Do you have any, um, any thoughts about how to counter that trend? Well, um, the policy incentives? so the, um, the challenge with vaccines is that, you know, they're not really lucrative. You know, you you know, you you take one and you immunize typically once. There's some exceptions. Gardasil, which is the uh, papillomavirus vaccine, uh, which is useful for preventing uh, cervical and oropharyngeal cancers, is an example where you have to take more than one of these. But they're not as lucrative as medications that you take on a regular basis, and the risk is high that someone is going to have a side effect. And unless you have indemnification of the manufacturer, they're reluctant to produce that vaccine because, you know, they're, the downsides are, the downside, potential downside is large and the upside is not so large. That said, there are a number of people who are, you know, in the philanthropic community who are firmly invested in the idea of making vaccines possible. The Gates Foundation, for example, has realized that this is the only efficient way to, you know, to prevent disease. Um, I have struggled myself with um, uh, a number of people who have been, you know, uh, complaining about the health risks, the health, the health, the safety, and risks of measles uh, virus vaccine and the MMR. So I've been fighting this battle with Andrew Wakefield uh, since 2000. And last year, when, during the Tribeca Film Festival, we were able to prevent him from airing his, his uh, film called Vaxxed, that some of you may have heard about. Uh, but he was able to get it you know, on screen anyway, and anything that can go on the internet can go anywhere. And Bobby Kennedy is pushing you know, the risks associated with thimerosal. So, um, as with any intervention, there were always going to be people who are going to have adverse effects. But if you look on balance at risk-benefit, 
the benefit is clearly there. And I think now that Lyme, for example, um, is becoming better appreciated as a problem nationally. And if you believe in climate change or don't, there's no question but that the distribution of ticks is changing across North America. We're seeing more and more Lyme disease. And I'm optimistic that this will make a difference and prompt people to get behind vaccine manufacture for Lyme again. So for the, uh, the uh, plus one uh, project that you presented, uh, did those patients manifest in like a, uh, multiple sclerosis type symptoms where it's relaxed or remitting or chronic progressive? Oh, oh, you're talking about the, the, the pork worker neuropathy project. No, yeah. it, was really, it, was, it was really a peripheral neuropathy and the best model for it was something that was developed by Raymond Adams and uh, Byron Waxman in the 60s, mid 60s, called experimental allergic neuritis. So the principle was the same. Uh, they administered peripheral nervous system myelin together with uh, Freund's adjuvant and induced this disease. I can tell by your question, you know what I'm talking about with Freund's adjuvant. So yes, that's what it looked like. And when the, uh, when the agent was removed, it improved. Now, I, I would predict that many of those individuals would have improved had they received plasmapheresis. And in fact, the first study that I did of this sort, my first project in science really was with HIV-associated neuropathy, where there was something that looked like Guillain-Barre, which we treated with lymphocytophoresis, plasmapheresis, and all of those patients improved.